What's going on? We're here to talk about MacBooks. So my name is Nick. I work at the uh, security team at a company called Figma. And recently our team was thinking about if we had malware on one of our company laptops, what would one, someone want to do with this malware, right? All of our laptops are MacBooks, our employees use Chrome. The obvious answer is they'd want to read people's Chrome cookies. Like we don't have interesting data on our laptops anymore. Our emails are in Gmail, right? Our other interesting data is in other SaaS apps on the internet. This is the actual data you want off a laptop. Um, so if you have a shell on someone's MacBook, can you read your Chrome, their Chrome cookies and how do you do it? And I, I can detect that like some security people are skeptical of this idea, right? The answer is, of course, this is a law of nature, right? If, if you have a malicious program running as you, surely that program can take over any other program running as you, right? Like you can, you can use GDB or LLDB or something to take over code execution. You can launch Chrome as a subprocess and like read its memory after it's launched to read cookies straight out of memory. Maybe you can take over the computer's mouse on their, their MacBook and click around if all else fails, right? Open the debug console, go to like where you as a user would read the cookies, just read them directly out of there, right? So surely you can always do this stuff anyway if you're running as, as the user. Except that's not true on a Mac. You see, Apple built iOS. iOS is crazy, right? You run potentially malicious programs on your iPhone um, and you can mostly trust that those programs can't take over other apps. And like 10 years ago, they brought this stuff into Mac OS. A, uh, a program on Mac OS that is running under a different Apple developer under code signing cannot take over another program necessarily. This is what underpins like accessibility permissions. You can't take over the mouse. This is what decides whether you get like Bluetooth access, things like that. Um, so you can't just take over Chrome necessarily. Now I'm, I'm going to tell you that you can, but it doesn't have to be that way, right? This is a design feature of the way that Chrome is built. So what we're going to talk about is I'm going to give you three attacks that you can use to steal cookies on Chrome. There are more attacks, but these are just three that I think are interesting. I'm going to tell you a couple ways you can prevent some of these attacks from being done, but not all of them. I haven't come up with protections for all of them. And for the ones that we can't prevent, we can at least try to detect whether they're happening. So the first one I want to talk about is the Chrome remote debugger, right? There's this thing that you can use if you're, if you're running like Selenium on your computer, for example, and it like takes over Chrome and clicks around to run like automated tests. The way it works is it runs Chrome with this remote debugging server um, where you can send it commands to tell it to click on things. If you Google how to steal cookies on a MacBook, like you find this blog post that explains how to do this from 2018, it's super cool. Uh, basically you launch Chrome, you tell it, listen on this port, uh, I'm going to connect to that port and I'm going to tell it, I would like you to give me the list of the user's cookies, like all of them for all the websites. And it says, sure, yeah, one, one big response, it sends you all their cookies. Um, this was cooler in 2018 when you could launch Chrome in headless mode and so the user wouldn't even know this is happening. These days, headless Chrome doesn't have the same cookies as normal GUI Chrome. So this doesn't work as well, um, but you could still, you could launch like normal Chrome and the user would see something weird happening, but you could steal the cookies. So that's one way. Another attack is like, surely Chrome has to store the cookies somewhere, right? When you reboot your computer, you're still logged into Facebook. Where does it store them? It stores them in this file. Uh, it's got all the fields that cookies have, like which website they're for, whether it's an HTTP only cookie, stuff like that. But the file does not contain the actual cookie value. It encrypts the cookie value. And it encrypts it with an encryption key that's in your login keychain. This is where stuff gets kind of cool. Who can read this encryption key? If you're Chrome and you have app, uh, Google's Mac OS code signing certificate, you can read this key, no problem. If another program tries to read this key, uh, your MacBook prompts the user for their password. Um, so if you just ask the keychain for the key, you probably can't get it. Um, or honestly, the, the message is not that clear what it is that the user is being asked for. So they might just type through it, that might work. So if you want to decrypt something, you can either get the key or find a way to attack the crypto, right? Um, so if you can read this file, you can probably write to this file, right? You can copy paste a cookie that you want to steal to a new cookie in a new row in this SQLite database for another website. Um, a website that you control and just wait for the user to visit that website. Or you can like, I don't know, you can launch Chrome pointing at that website and make them send cookies to you, right? Uh, you could imagine that 
you, you could imagine a crypto scheme where the encrypted value takes into account like which website the user is using or something, um, so that a cookie for GitHub is not valid for a different website. Uh, but they they currently don't do this. Cool. So that's another way. The third attack that I want to talk about. Uh, I honestly think this is the coolest one. We're going to take advantage of the fact that Chrome is not one process, right? It is a complicated multi-process program. The way that Chrome works is when uh, you launch the Chrome main process, it, the one of the first things it does is it asks a keychain for your cookie encryption key, and then it starts off this other process that's responsible for doing a lot of things, but one of the things it does is read the actual cookie database, read and write your cookies, and decrypt them it sends the encryption key to this other process, the network service. They're both signed by Chrome, but they have different like signing IDs. And then the network service actually reads your cookies. So one thing that's cool is if you are an attacker, you can replace the, the binary where the network service binary lives in like the Chrome application bundle with malware and then kill the process because you have user permissions, right? You can still kill other processes the user's running. And Chrome is very helpful. It'll say, oh my gosh, the network service has crashed. I got to relaunch the network service. And it will do the startup process again. It'll send the cookie encryption key to this uh, malicious process you've now gotten it to launch. Uh, that process is going to launch the network service, send the encryption key to it. And then it can start speaking IPC to the network service and just tell it, please like read these cookies and do these things with it. Um, so the important thing here is that Chrome and the network service are the only processes that are actually talking to the keychain and the cookie file, right? Malware is like getting launched by Chrome and it's launching another process, but it's not actually reading these files. And the reason that's important, I'll get into later. Uh, and don't even think about like trying to use file permissions to fix this because the malware could just bring its own copy of Chrome, right? Or you could like download it from the internet. And even if it's not the same Chrome binary the user usually uses, it's still a signed copy of Chrome. It's still can read the keychain, it can still write to this file. Okay, what are some things we can do about this? The first thing we can do is if you pay Google for Chrome Enterprise, there's a flag you can turn on to disable the remote debugger. So when you set remote debugging allowed false, uh, and then you try to launch Chrome with a remote debugger, it just prints out an error message, doesn't work. Um, everyone should turn this on, this is super cool. You, you might have trouble as I did with like, you have actual engineers who use tools like Selenium, so you just probably just have to exempt it for those, those engineers. Um, but you can maybe get away with like telling them to run Chrome with a different user data directory or something like that so that if someone manages to launch Chrome with a remote debugger, it's not getting their real cookies. I guess that's one, one approach. Uh, another thing you can do is you can use this program called Santa. And this is a Mac OS talk. Any hands in the air for people who know what Santa is? Any familiarity? Awesome. So most folks know Santa as this like binary authorization tool, but it's also got this thing called file authorization. And the idea is we can tell the OS whenever someone tries to open one of these files, in this case we're going to talk about the, the cookies file, I want you to ask me, the, the Santa agent, uh, whether that process should be able to open the file. And this is at like the OS levels. So this is not just file permissions. Um, so the idea is like Chrome tries to open the cookies file, another program tries to, and even if it has user level permissions, at the kernel level it gets blocked. So my recommendation is you should have two rules in Santa for which processes can open the cookies file. You should tell, you, you should tell Santa to let the network service, which is that Chrome, uh, com.google.chrome.helper process open the file. Don't let normal Chrome open the file uh, because if malware like from the CLI launches Chrome, like application, or whatever the path is to Chrome, and then the path to the cookies file, Chrome will open the cookies file and say, oh my gosh, this is a binary file. They must want me to download the file. It'll copy it to your downloads folder. So don't do that. Um, and the second thing you should protect is if you're using the remote debugging allowed flag, you should protect the policy folder because malware can just delete this folder. Uh, when you set Chrome Enterprise flags, it tells Chrome that or what, what Chrome does, it saves locally which flags you have set. There's like cool like PKI and signing to make sure that it's actually from a Google server. But if the files where it stores those just aren't there, it assumes it's not managed. Um, and when Chrome launches, there's a couple seconds before it actually goes and re-downloads its managed policy, and that's plenty of time for the remote debugger to launch and for you to seal the cookies. So protect the, the policy directory. Uh, 
I have no ideas for how to fix the IPC problem, so if you have ideas, please let me know. So if you want to detect someone doing this weird IPC attack, we're going to try to find cases where the network service is getting launched by another process that isn't Chrome. And the thing that we did at Figma to, to check, the, check the, for this is we use this thing called OS Query. Um, some of you may be familiar with this. It's like a cool logging tool where you can write SQL queries to like give you logging pipelines for things that are happening in the operating system. And basically, you want to look for uh, processes getting launched. You have to like kind of build a table of parent processes and child processes, but you have to look for processes where um, the target process getting exec is the network service and the parent process is not actual Chrome. That's what I have for you. Do we have any questions? Yes. The question is, what about session cookies uh, that are not like they don't have a max age and they don't expire? So they die when your Chrome process dies. I think they only live in memory. That's my memory, my my recollection. So they don't actually get persisted to disk. So I think you. I think you'd also have a hard time. Uh, I think trying to steal session cookies, you'd have a hard time using any of the attacks I listed because you'd have to attack like the active running process that the user has launched from their GUI that they're clicking around in, and that's when they like logged into an application. Um, and so I think like mucking around with the network service through IPC, for example, would uh, cause the session cookies to go away. Other questions? Yes. Do we have another mic? Cool. The question is about other browsers. Uh, I think on Mac OS, there's like three browsers that exist. It's like Safari, Firefox, and other things that are Chromium-based browsers that kind of reskin Chrome. Um, so all of the Chromium browsers typically encrypt cookies on disk, so the attacks against crypto will all work. Um, and I think like Arc and Brave and browsers like that do not have uh, a remote debugging tool that you can launch. They just like don't exist. Um, so I guess they're a little bit more protected against this problem. Um, Firefox stores cookies unencrypted on disk, so you can also use Santa to just protect the file where it stores the cookies. And Safari, I don't actually understand how this works, but Safari, like Mac OS builds in something like what we're trying to do with Santa here, where it just prevents other programs from opening the Safari cookies database. Um, and I guess another interesting area is Electron apps. So it's actually an optional flag that you don't have to turn on in Electron if you're running an Electron app to encrypt cookies on disk. Uh, a lot of apps don't have this turned on. If an app does have it turned on, you can still like try to use IPC to either get the main process to tell you the encryption key and then go read it out of memory or out of the file, um, or you can do the IPC attack to read it out of the network service. Yes. I was hoping someone would ask about extensions. So I, I don't actually know what um, all of the protections that Chrome has here, but it seems hard to, as malware, put malicious extensions into someone's user data directory. Maybe someone else here knows the details here, but there's at least some like PKI that Chrome does, or it makes sure that the extension at least has been published on the Chrome Web Store. So if you mess around with like either the content of an existing extension, it checks that. Uh, the extension is actually signed by um, the certificate for that extension. There's like a per extension certificate, and then that gets signed by the Chrome Web Store. Um,
but like, I guess you could write a malicious extension and then publish it and then put that in someone's user data directory, that'd probably work. Uh, so I'd also recommend using OS Query to get a list of people's Chrome extensions and I don't know, have a sense of whether they seem like malicious extensions or not. Um, some, some companies do extension allow listing so that when Chrome launches, it just doesn't let you run with malicious extensions or with extensions that are not on your allow list installed. This is obviously disruptive because people have to ask some IT person to let them use an extension. Um, yeah. Any other questions? All right, thanks. <laughs>